The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, Episode 516. Gen Con 2017 Preview. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Tom and I are joined by Jamie from The Secret Cabal to discuss some recent games played, present a tale of amazement, and answer a bunch of questions about Gen Con. Plus, we find out how big The Secret Cabal party is going to be this year in Indianapolis, and we close the show by highlighting our top ten games debuting at Gen Con 2017. I'm Eric Summer, and here's your host, the Willy Wonka of board gaming, Tom Vassell. In a world of your imagination, and I'm tired of singing this song. I just saw the show on Broadway. I'm really, I, I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. I, I, I'm <laughs> okay. Is Gene Hackman better or Johnny Depp? Gene Hackman? Boy, what a crazy mistake to have made. I hate you all. <laughs> You mean Gene Wilder. Tom! I, I yes. Do. Gene I Hackman, so, I cannot believe you. Uh, I, I actually like the Johnny Depp film better. I think it's quirky. <laughs> I like the Danny Elfman music. I mean, yes, pure imagination is fantastic. You can't beat that. Candyman, still pretty good. <sighs> but uh, but the, the um, Oompa Loompa songs from the Danny Elfman soundtrack, those are fun. Yeah, but that's not the point. I didn't ask that. I asked which Willy Wonka did you like. All right, better? Willy Wonka, Gene Wilder is probably better. But Christian Borel's pretty good. He's he's got sort of a crazy manic energy to him. It was fun. Gene Wilder is Willy Wonka. I couldn't imagine saying that anybody is better than Gene Wilder. That movie was insane and scary and creepy. Gives kids nightmares, and that's what it's supposed to do. There's no telling where we're going. Yeah, that's like one of <laughs> where the, <laughs> the rivers flowing. Yes, nightmares. All right, folks. Well, welcome to our show. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer, and I'm Jamie. Now, Jamie joins us from the Secret Cabal podcast for our annual tradition of talking about Gen Con. And wow, Gen Con is two weeks away, but this is a weird year because it should be like now. When you're listening to this, this is usually when Gen Con starts. It's actually a much later show this year. No, it feels like you get a little extra time. Yeah. Oh, I'm super glad. I like having this uh, in-between period, between conventions. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I could imagine with Dice Tower Con, and then you'd have to turn around and go right to Gen Con immediately. That's kind of, it's got to be rough on you. Well, this is the Gen Con of Gen Cons. They have sold out. Wow. It is Gen Con Ow. 50. What, I, I don't know what the sold out numbers is, but I would guess 70. That seems like, Oof. I don't know. It was I, super crowded last year. It, I didn't even know they had a sold out number. I mean, I guess they have to sort of have a sold out number, but I never expected that we would ever see that because you always hear about PAX East and PAX West and all these other, they, they sell out in days, you know, and I was like, well, Gen Con never sells out and Gen Con will never sell out. And this year you can't get there if you don't have a badge at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But then. Did it feel like it should have sold out last year? Well, I mean, I never really thought about it like that. I mean, there's always the, the, the hotel debacle that everybody complains like crazy about, and the hotels sell out so quickly, but then the show itself never sells out. You never really think about, you know, you almost think about that as being the sellout. Now, all of a sudden, they have this second sellout, and, and I'm terrified to go there. It's going to feel like you're walking through pea soup. Right. In theory, there should be space for lots and lots of people, because if you walk away from the exhibit hall, there should there's space. There's other stuff going on. There's exterior buildings that have events. There's there's mm-hmm. movies to watch. There There is enough space for everyone to spread out and do this. But I think what they're worried about and where the sellout number has to come from is they know a certain percentage of people are going to be in X location at, at such and such a time. And right. that is going to be overwhelming and probably push fire codes and stuff like that. You know what terrifies me the most, actually? It's not the it's not the exhibitors hall or the events or the live events or any of this stuff. What terrifies me is dinner. Mm. The restaurants I'm going to go to, is it going to be a two-hour wait to get in any restaurant? The mm. food trucks outside, is it going to be a two-hour wait to stand in line to get a donut or a taco? That's super uh, fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm terrified about that. I'm going to get some reservations is what I'm going to do. At the food yeah. trucks, yeah. 
No, no, at the restaurants. I'm going to skip the the food trucks to get a reservation for lunch. Well, you better do it before this podcast airs so people don't copy you. I, yeah, I, by I, the way, Tom, did, did you do that already? Because that, that was part of your plan, I think. <laughs> already done. The reservations have been made. My um, hero. I better do that. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Now, as a public service announcement from both myself and Jamie, I believe he's gotten flack for this too. We know that Gen Con is more than the exhi- exhibition hall. We know that, okay? <laughs> and we've never yep. said otherwise. Yes, I, I get quite a bit of flack about that. And uh, we've cleared that up in a number of cases. We've shut those people up. <laughs> we know there's plenty of things to do. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so let's be – first of all, a co- couple quick announcements. Gen Con might be sold out, but there's two conventions that haven't sold out. The first is PAX Unplugged. I, they just mm. announced today, as we're recording this, a list of exhibitors there. And holy cow. Mm. Wow. Holy cow. They have like everyone is there. I know. I'm looking at that list and I'm like, this is this is great. This is going to be the next convention to go to. Yeah, I'm 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 very impressed. And they're they're telling me already like twenty thousand people have signed up and stuff. That's mm-hmm. crazy. That's like that would make that the second biggest board game convention or tabletop. Sure. Wow! Right away. Uh, and then there's also the Dice Tower cruise. Come on a cruise. There's still room. It's in December. We want you to come. Indeed. So I'm curious about the Dice Tower Cruise, Tom. How? What are the logistics of that? Are you going to take your entire library on the ship and have a library on there, or do people bring their own games? How that's going to work? Yes, it's a bit of both. We we uh, bring the we bring the library on. We don't bring the entire Dice Tower Con library on. It's too big. Sure, so yeah, brought, I imagine so. Last year, I think we brought like 300 games. I curated it myself. I brought a lot of games I had just gotten at Essen, mm-hmm. so there was some hot stuff there. And then we gave out a lot of games to people, and then a, a, some people brought their own games. But mm-hmm. there wasn't that many people that it was that big of a problem. We had 400 people sure. at any given point, maybe 200 are gaming, which is like 50 to 100 games. Mm-hmm. So, Well, that seems to make sense. That, that, that helps out a little, having some games there. People can bring their own. Because, you know, like, it's kind of tough to travel. you got to fly, you got to get on ships, and like, you can't carry a gigantic bag of games with you everywhere you go. So that's cool that you have some there. Yeah, it's library. the logistics of getting it on and off the ship. The library itself is always interesting, too. We have to pack it all up and then take it all out and then pack it all mm-hmm. up again when it's all over. You can't just cart the wheeled carts that we use for Dice Tower Con. We can't use those on the ship because they have to be transported on and off uh, through a specific uh, channel. Through the union. <laughs> oh, oh, so you have union dock workers that must load. <laughs> yep. And then we get on the I ship just, early. I just pictured Eric pushing it up a gangplank at some point. Yeah, that's just my job. Yeah, <laughs> We were carrying tables, if I recall correctly. I was going to uh, say, we, we did carry tables last year. Oh, we, man. That was fun. Okay, well, let's get talking about games because I'm sure that's what people want to hear. We're just going to talk about a few games before we get into our Gen Con stuff. And I want to start with a pretty big game called Too Many Bones. Mm, I've been hearing a lot about this one. Is it big because there are too many bones? Thanks, Eric. <laughs> um, so, too <laughs> <laughs> Too Many Bones is a game from the Chip Theory games. They made Hoppomachus. And Hoppomachus was a fun game, but it wasn't, you know, anything to write home about. This one is a much bigger game. It still uses poker chips. They like having poker chips as your heroes, and then you use red poker chips, like light, lighter, like light plastic chips underneath them to, to keep track of their health. Hmm. It is called a dice rolling RPG, and I think that's correct. You have a character sheet, which is actually a mouse pad. And this mouse pad has holes in it where you put dice. And you start with different stats. And you also have 16 unique dice that you can get as the game goes by. You, you might start with a couple of them depending on the character you pick. But as the game goes by, every time you go up, quote, a level, you can up one of your stats. Or you can add one of these specific dice. And then you go through a deck of cards. And each card is something, you know, you meet some merchants, whatever. Uh, but some, most of the time it's combat. And combat's on this really small grid. And basically you are using your special abilities. You are rolling dice. The enemies roll dice on an automatic level. And it's very puzzly, very strategic. I would put it in the same camp as Gloomhaven as in the puzzling nature. It's not a, it's not a, um, let's roll lots of dice and see if we hit the enemy. No, it's more like what's the right die to roll at the right time. I I really like it. Uh, Hmm. I'm very impressed with it. It's very deep. It's very long. And the components are, while the, Dice are neat, and the poker chips are nice. Everything has a pretty, I think it's a pretty shoddy, not shoddy, I guess, but looks amateur, the whole design. The graphic mm. design of it just bleh to me. Mm. 
But I do like that you have these really unique dice, and it makes the different archetypes. You know, they're not. There's one guy who's a throws bombs, and so he has to roll dice to get pieces of these bombs together. Then he gets the bombs, and then he can throw different types of bombs depending on what other dice he uses. Another guy's a berserker who has raging attacks, which is kind of typical for this kind of game. But the way that the dice use it, he keeps rolling dice, and it's charging it up until he finally just unloads on the bad guys. Um, I did a full video review so you can see more about it because it's hard to fit into a lot of this on an audio explaining how the game works. But I, I, again, I, it feels like an amazing game done by an amateur publisher. I don't hmm. know how else to explain it. Like, I, I, and again, I'll probably get flack. You know, people say, well, but the cards, it's, sometimes it's hard to read them. There's text everywhere. Each character has a sheet with an extremely huge amount of terms on both sides. I mean, maybe if you like RPGs, you will like this just – fire hose of information but it's really not an rpg either it's just a game you play through to the end you know it's not well, i'm an rpg player and i don't necessarily love a fire hose of information at me it's just that's what you have to deal with in most rpgs so i guess it kind of feels like that but it's certainly i mean many rpgs that are coming out now are streamlined even like our board games you know they're trying to streamline those systems but uh i like the way i'm looking at this game and i dig the way that the dice work like you put them in the holes, similar to a scythe where you put your little tokens in the holes on your player board. I like that aspect of this, too. I think that makes it kind of a, a neat little tactical feel to the game. I think I'm going to add that to things I like about games, sticking things in holes. <laughs> <laughs> well, who doesn't love that? Everybody that any game that has that people. Sure. Go on and on about how great that is. Yeah, right. And that's why, like for Terraforming Mars and for Eclipse, people buy those trays where you can actually mm-hmm. do they can that. do that. Yeah. It just it just has a very satisfying feel to it. You're like, yes, does. this goes here. <laughs> <laughs> it, everything in its place. And it keeps everything in place. Even if you bump it, it's all right. Uh-huh. So too many bones I recommend to anybody who likes these heavier puzzly type type board game RPGs. Just realize there's a lot of text and a lot of things going on, but if you're willing to peel that back, it's a very steep learning curve. I mean, a very steep learning curve, but I think some people are going to really enjoy it. I enjoyed it enough to keep it. That's too many bones. Hmm. Well, I want to talk about a uh, space-based pick-up-and-deliver game that I actually mentioned in last week's episode that we recorded at Origins. I, I got this there. It's called Star that Merchant Traders. of Venus? It's not. <laughs> It was actually originally created about the same time uh, as Merchant of Venus, and the designer specifically did not play Merchant so that he wouldn't be influenced by it. He knew that they were similar themes, and so he wanted them to be you know, separate products. Uh, and this is a reissue of that game that's recently come out. In Star Traders, you're trying to earn enough prestige to eventually become the new Star Czar. And you you earn prestige by picking up and delivering things around this map that's this sort of symmetrical, five-spurred galactic map. And the longer the paths, there's all these lines that connect the different worlds, and the longer the world paths are, the higher a die roll you need to travel along that path. Uh, You get, I think, five actions on a turn, uh, and one of those actions can be I roll a die and I try and move along this path. Uh, If you don't get as high a roll as you want, you can travel along a different path that you did roll high enough to go on, or you can simply say, all right, I'm going to re-roll and spend another action to try and go along the path that you really want to. Uh, there are There's one contract for each player that's in the game. They have these nice little markers that show you where the pickup point is and where the deliver point is. If you successfully pick up and deliver, uh, you then get prestige for doing that. Um, And once you reach a certain prestige point, you uh, then can take one final mission, uh, like the Imperial mission, uh, and if you succeed in doing that, then you win the game. So there's this this sort of race aspect to the whole thing. And one player can be trying to do their Imperial mission, the other players are trying to get there just as fast and, and beat them to the punch. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of take that cards, rule break, breaker cards that you draw at the end of your turn uh, that then can then mess with other players and, uh, and, and allow you to break some of the rules. This game gets points for its style. Uh, each of the planets is named after a sci-fi author. And the goods sort of apply to that particular sci-fi author's work. Uh, So if you're picking up something at, say, the Philip K. Dick world, you will have an item that relates to his work. Uh, So that's pretty cool. Uh, And and I like that race aspect at the end where there's this this hurry up and finish, um, you know, last last delivery to actually win the game, victory lap sort of thing. Um, 
So it, that was enjoyable, but I think there's a little too much take that in this game. It's a little too repetitive um, and a little too random. I mean, the, the where you're picking up, dropping off stuff is is all out of a deck um, with, with random results as to what the next pickup and deliver is going to be. So you might be right next to the item that's next to be delivered at the exact time you need it, uh, whereas somebody else is way over on the other side of the board and has no chance to even try and get that that contract. Uh, and those take that cards are almost too powerful. There's several different levels you can play this game at. Uh, there's a, two kids versions that I have not yet tried that I do want to try with my kids that sort of introduce the concepts, streamline things, take out those take that cards. Um, there are gates that you can build that make it easier to travel around the board, which is, I think, key to lowering the randomness. This isn't terrible, but... There are several pick-up-and-deliver games in space that I would play before this. Firefly, Merchant of Venus, and Zaya are all stronger than this game. And unfortunately, I think I have to give this a pass because there's three that do it better. That's Star Traders. I gotta say, Eric, that it is a stellar review when you say that one of your favorite aspects of the game is the hurry up and finish mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. It's almost over. Let's go, people. That's I, that's happened many times in our play group. We're like, okay, will this actually make the game go faster? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, the, another downside is that in order to get that final contract, you have to comp- pass a die roll. So, like, I've got enough points to go for the final contract, and I can play cards to mitigate that, add numbers to my roll, uh, get bonuses, but I still need to roll above a five, I think, in order to get that final contract. And if you fail, you lose prestige, you lose money, and you have to really claw your way back. And that I didn't really like very much either. Mm. Sounds dated. It sounds like what you're saying there is it sounds old school. It, it is. It is definitely old school. And the graphic design is, while bright, colorful, and clear, they did work hard to make sure it's, you know, helpful for colorblind players and that it can be understood. It still, it's, it lacks the polish of more modern designs. Well, the game that I played and would like to talk about is one that came from Greater Than Games Fabled Nexus. Uh, it is Spirit Island. Now, this one is a cooperative game in which you play spirits that uh, inhabit this island, along with the indigenous peoples of this island that are friendly. But these conquistador guys are coming in, and they're building towns and cities, and they're putting this bubbly blight stuff all over your lands and destroying it. And they don't care about the indigenous people. In fact, they'll attack them and kill them. And you, as the spirits, are trying to scare these people off of the island. You're, you want to get them out of there and get these indigenous people happy again. So you are all of these different spirits. You have your own spirit board, and it has all these different abilities that you can perform as a spirit, like a, like a fire spirit or the lightning spirit or the, 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 the river spirit or the, the ocean spirit, whatever. And they all have their own play style. And what you're doing is trying to play abilities, these cards you have, these powers that will move conquistadors and the towns all around the board. You'll move the indigenous peoples around the board. You'll kill some of them. You'll gather them in a certain location. And all of these things are generating fear. And in the middle of the turn, the conquistadors will now explore the land and they'll build new cities and they'll drop this blight stuff down on the land. They're ravaging the land. They're, they're killing off the indigenous peoples and they're dropping their waste product all over the place. And you're trying to sort of engineer getting your people into the right places so that they don't die and they retaliate and kill these people, generating you more fear to send these people or these, uh, these humans off the island. Uh, this game, I have to say, is number one, very complex and it's very deep. It's a it's a very it's a heavy style cooperative game. And let me start off by saying that the rule book, if you read the rule book, read the second half of the rule book first, <laughs> then the first half. OK, because I tried to read the rule book twice and kept failing to get through it. I didn't understand what they were saying. But then I flipped through and went to the end and the end says game concepts. I read the second half of the book, understood all the game concepts, and then went back and understood how to use them. So if you get the game, just read the rule book backwards. Okay. Huh. Um, I, I, so hmm. I actually hate well, you, you disagree? I, I, I actually like when they put game concepts in the middle of the rules that rather than separately. 
Well, yeah, you're right. If they would have put all of those things in like a sidebar, for example, that would have probably been a much better way of laying out this book. But they didn't. So read the rule book backwards. Actually, I should also add a caveat. You should also play when they say, here's a starter setup and maybe you should play this way. You should do that in this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, so I got to say that this game, what I love most about it is I tend to like competitive games more than I like cooperative games. I like cooperative games, but this cooperative game gives me a, a competitive feel almost because I'm controlling my guy in my little corner of the world. And I can expand out into everybody else's corner of the world and help them, too. But most the beginning half of the game, you're sort of working on your own area. And you're coordinating, moving other people's things around when you can. But until you expand out into the board, you you got your own thing going. You know what you can do. And then when everybody says, all right, here are the things that we can do. How are we going to coordinate doing them to make this game happen? And there's probably about half a dozen things that you got to be paying attention to at any one time. And a lot of times you'll be doing things that you need to do so you don't lose. But you're not doing things you need to do to win. And one of the coolest things about this game is trying to make both of those things coordinate. That's why you're moving guys around the board. You're moving the enemy guys around the board and your own guys around the board so that you can mash them together and make sure that you're stopping the inevitable plus winning the game, trying mm. to scare them off of the island. This game is great. I thought it was a blast. All of us had such a fun time playing this game and trying to figure out these puzzles. And I'm excited to play it again because I have, it didn't even add in any of the, the extra variants, like the, the adversaries that they allow you to have, you know, like the Prussians can come and the English can come and it does different things in the game. Uh, there's like, I don't know if I have a Kickstarter version or the retail version, but it comes with eight spirits. We played with the starter spirits and didn't play with the heavier, uh, hard ones. And I'm excited to get to those and try how the medium and hard uh, spirits work. Man, I just love this Spirit Island. It was a lot, a lot the, of fun. Uh, I want to play with the Spirit of Nightmares. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, that feeds right into the whole concept of fear. You know, you're playing the, every, you draw the fear cards and play them and cool things happen. Man, I just really, really liked how this game worked. The mechanics are are complex and a little bit fiddly, but if you get over that hump, you learn it and you start playing it and you start working out these strategies and it was just fun. I dug mm. it a lot. That is Spirit Island. I want to try that one. I think you'd like it, Eric. I think you would too, Eric, but I do realize it is a very, very uh, intensively heavy game. Mm. Actually, not not one like to just throw at the kids. Oh, no. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a 13 plus game. It really is. And also the mm -hmm. theme is pretty dark in many ways too. It is. It sure is. You're killing people. <laughs> and the people don't care about the indigenous people of this island, and they're killing them mm. to get out of the way so I can build a city here, you know? But, um, it, yeah, the, the cutesy, happy cartoon art on the cover isn't as dark as the game is. <laughs> mm. Tales of Amazement. In the U.K., Board game cafes are starting to take off, with one opening in my own city of Portsmouth sometime soon. Further down the road, there exists a nice little venue in Southampton called Board in the City, which has a decent-sized board game library, as well as tasty food and friendly, welcoming staff, many of whom volunteer at the cafe. It is the site for one of my many gaming groups I attend, and it caters for many of the bare essentials we require, such as large tables and good lighting. The cafe is run as a non-profit organization and has growing support from the local community, but despite this, the costs of operating within a commercial property in our area are high, and so staying within the black requires a great deal of time and commitment from the staff, as does any other small business. Recently, however, to make matters worse, the cafe was broken into during the night, and the robbers managed to swipe cash floats from the till, while also causing considerable damage to the window, which was the source of forced entry. Evidence showed that the robbery took place within the space of only two minutes, so clearly they knew where to look. I was sad to hear of the news, but also angry that anyone would want to deliberately target an organization that clearly states on the outside windows that it's a non-profit company for community benefit. Especially as even though the money meant a lot to the cafe, it could have only been worth a token value to the robbers themselves. Our gaming group showed their support in record-breaking attendance numbers the next night. 
but I felt that the cafe deserved better. I therefore brought the matter to the attention of the largest Facebook UK gaming chat group, which I am personally a part of, and asked for the assistance of everyone to show their support also. The group held a collective whip round to raise money to help recover the cost of the cafe replacing their till floats and repairing the damage. The vast majority of the group had probably never visited or even heard of the cafe unless they were local residents, and so I was taken aback by how willingly everyone was willing to contribute. In less than 24 hours since the robbery took place, the whip round had met with a resounding success, and our group had managed to raise more than enough funds for the cafe to recover their losses. Naturally, the owners of the cafe were at a loss for words at the generosity shown by the UK board gaming community. What I was able to take from this was just how wonderful it was to be a reviewer within the community of board gamers. Of course, everyone can encounter some bad apples in the bunch. Nobody is perfect, but it proved that when good gamers band together, great achievements can be made. We all hope that the robbers involved will meet justice eventually, but it's refreshing to know that when a bad event occurs within the hobby, board gamers will always remain united and stronger together. Huzzah! That's a really good story. I gotta go Google what a whip round is. I, yes, that, that is a term <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with. <laughs> I think it probably, it like, past the hat is probably the closest American equivalent. The contributions collected from a group of people for a specific go. purpose. Yeah, a well, whip round. The, the dice tower is an educational thing. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, that, might, that might have been a secret cabal educational moment there. Okay. <laughs> We've I all was, learned something today. I was the one with Google ready, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a fantastic story. I love that because... It, it makes me feel good when our community bands together like this, and it shows that the the vast majority of the people in the board gaming and the tabletop gaming community in general are just amazing people that are ready to jump at the chance to help other people, particularly those in need. And uh, that just makes me feel good every time I see anything like that. I really like how you know folks who had no direct relationship to the cafe heard the story and were willing to give i mean that we we see that sort of thing happen a lot in this hobby and that's one of the reasons why it's fantastic it does it does it is great so keep that in mind as we approach gen con and you get mad at the guy whose stroller cut right in front of you (laughs) well i'm not i'm not doing any whip rounds for that guy (laughs) if i get hit in the head with another backpack this year i'm gonna have a whip (laughs) round to get them out of here yeah, that's definition two. <laughs> okay, so we are going to actually talk about um, Gen Con. But before we get into Gen Con, we're going to let Jamie tell you what the Secret Cabal is doing at Gen Con and how you can find them there. Ooh, well, thank you, Tom. Well, mostly we're going to be rolling around the convention hall and goofing off. But there is one particular sanctioned event that I am very excited for. On Saturday night at 8 p.m., we're having our typical Secret Cabal meetup at the Tow Yard Brewing Company, which is a couple of blocks up the way near the uh, Lucas Oil Stadium. And this is going to be the biggest event we've ever run because the brewery itself has offered to shut down the entire building, restaurant and bar, for us to just bring in all of our people. Anybody who wants to come and hang out and have a great time, it's it's open just for us. Wow. And we're going to have the giant board game raffle publishers from all over the exhibitor hall are donating games. So There's going to be a gigantic hundreds of games. We're going to give away stacks of games to people with a raffle. Uh, they're they're brewing a special beer for us, which we have. We we ran a contest to name the beer, and it is called Full Froth. Uh, they're going to have. <laughs> I thought you said gonna, that was like the most put an answer wasn't it? It was. It was the it was the most common answer given, and it kind of felt. I was like, man, I don't want to do the most common one. But when I looked over all of them, I was like, you know what? It makes perfect sense. I mean, we're, we were frothing at the mouth with full froth, and it just feels right with a, for a beer name. So they'll have that on tap there for us to, to be drinking. Uh, you know, we're going to have set up, you know, uh, Berkey's bringing in his, uh, his uh, game toppers and going to put them on the table. So we're going to have a bunch of games going on. The uh, Knockdown Barnes guy's coming, and he's going to set up Knockdown Barnes, a.k.a. Burlap Sack, for people to be playing. And wow. it's, it's going to be a, just a fun event. We're going to have a, a swag bag that we give out, 500 swag bags we've made, and we're going to be giving them out to at least 500 people. So hopefully we have that many, or not too many more than that. But, uh, yeah, so it's going to be a just a fun event for and anybody's welcome to come hang out, have a good time, get involved in the raffle. 
Uh, and that's, again, Saturday night at 8 p.m. at the Tow Yard Brewing Company. I'm very excited to get to this one. This wow. Year. I mean, you've come a long way from just, like, crashing the local bar. That's, and, that's and right. And hoping that they don't break the fire codes. <laughs> that's right. We did that. Our very first meetup we had was at the Omni Hotel Bar. And the first year we had eh, maybe 50 people. The next year we had eh, about 150 people. And that they were squeezing them in there. Uh, and we moved it to the to the Alexander Hotel after that. And then we even like we broke the fire codes at the Alexander Hotel, too. As a matter of fact, they stopped <laughs> letting people come in. Uh, and I had to stop that from happening. So then they opened up all the, the hallways in the hotel for the meetup as well. So it worked out wow. for us. this year. I'm hoping that it's that we're going to have ample room. They've even talked about they're going to put if it's raining, they're going to put up tents in the alley and it's going to flow out into the street as a block party. Whoa. Uh, they're even, they're even going to set up a bar out there where you can go out and get drinks outside if you want to. So I think they're treating us right. But well, the tow yard I, I, is. I hope it, it's lucrative for them as well so that you guys can continue to do this because this sounds like a great party. I do think it's going to be, uh, Eric, it, it, that's one of the things. I think that's actually why they came to us. They actually approached us about it because really? we were talking about how we were having trouble with the Alexander because uh, they needed to move us to a bigger room and they wanted to charge us for the bigger room. And we were like, but we sell thousands and thousands of dollars for you at the bar, more than you would ever have right. on this regular night. Alexander is not a hotel right by the convention center. Um, but the tow yard, they came to us and said, hey, we want to do this with you guys. I think it's because they're not right next. They're not the Ram, right? They're not right, right. next to the convention center. So yeah. I think they're missing out on some of the Gen Con business. Well, so I think they're like, now. this is. This is yeah. how we can get people down here on the weekends, and I think that's going to work out for us well, and I think they're going to be happy with the turnout, too. That's exciting. Really cool. It is. So we're going to be at a booth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, not nearly as exciting of a big event. Uh, that's uh, 2539. It's a booth. It's very close to where we were last year. Um, and we'll have – actually, we will have most – not most, but a lot of our new promos will be there. We'll have Eric Summoner, and Eric Woo-hoo! will sign them for you. And other things will be there. Uh, and everyone who comes by will get a free viral promo card. So, Ooh. Ooh. I think I have like 8,000, but hopefully that's enough. I hope that's enough. Well, and again, viral, viral's releasing at Gen Con in, this year, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Actually, this is the first year there's two Dice Diary Essentials, Viral and the expansion for Sheriff of Nottingham. Ooh. You got to bounce over there, pick up Viral, and then head over to the Dice Tower booth. Get well, your speaking promo. Speaking of that, that's the first. We have some questions that we have. And the first question that people asked us was what booth should one hit first on Thursday? How do you decide? Now, I have to actually be at my booth. Okay. <laughs> no, yep. and, and just, we're going to put the schedule for the booths online, but a quick rule of thumb if you want to see all the Dice Tower guys, we're there the first hour and the last hour. That's Correct. usually the, the easiest way to remember. But if you were not doing the booth, guys, or uh, Jamie, you're not, and mm-hmm. you were going in to grab a game, where would you go first? Where would you recommend people go? Well, it's really strange because there aren't any games releasing this year that have got me at full froth at this point. I mean, mm-hmm. I, like I love most of these games that I got on my list here for later in the episode, but none of them are really eating at me like I have in the past. What I would do... The very first booth that I would go to is I would head over to WizKids booth and pick up The Expanse because I think that that one's going to go quickly because I think a lot of people are into The Expanse right now. I think it's a a show that started off slow and picked up some buzz, and now WizKids coming out with the, the, the board game version designed by Jeff Engelstein, our buddy. Mm-hmm. Who's 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 made a name for himself in board game design. I think that's the booth that's going to to draw a lot of people. And I think if you want to get there and get a copy of that, you should go quick. There's going to be some companies with only a hundred copies of whatever games for whatever reason. I don't actually know all those, um, but you, it never hurts to necessarily go to fantasy flight or Simon or mm. one of the bigger companies and get in line sure. there and get the hot games at those. But True. I actually agree with Jamie. I'm there's a lot of, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of really cool games coming out at Gen Con, but there's no Seafall type game. Mm-hmm. Where I think people are going to be like punching each other to get it. Type of right. <laughs> there's no there's no cabbage patch doll game. Perhaps. 
I mean, what I would do is is look at uh, the the publishers that have limited quantities. You can you can go on Board Game Geek. In fact, they've got their new tool that's that they just released that that's a lot better than the Geek List format that they used to have. But you can see some of those publishers have said we're only going to have fifty copies a day of such and such. We're yeah. only going to have a hundred copies a day. Those are the ones that you want to target. Don't you know? Pick one place to run for and. Don't think you're going to be able to hit two or three, especially on Thursday. Keep in mind that if you're not a VIG, there is an entire group of people that have had an hour head start. And there are games that on Thursday are going to sell out, especially if they've uh, rationed them out before you even get a chance. Even if you're first in line in the general population, you won't get a chance at them. So you may have to wait until Friday, Saturday, Sunday to get a chance at them if they've rationed them. The Fantasy Flight has not announced what their big things are this year, have they yet? Uh, are they releasing L5R, the the Lord of the uh, Legend of the Five Rings LCG? Are they releasing that at Gen Con this year? I would imagine so. I don't know. They yeah. always announce it the two weeks, and we actually recorded this slightly before two weeks. Uh-huh. And the two weeks before the convention, they start announcing stuff. So we always try to guess what Fantasy Flight's going to do. But nowadays, it's less interesting for me. I'm like, uh, put Star Wars Game of Thrones in front of it, and that's what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, well, it works. Well, if they do release that Lord, uh, Legend of the Five Rings, I think that's going to be the one that everybody's going for. Because that's a huge... I mean, for years, that was one of the biggest CCGs there was. And people are fired up for that one. And I think that converting it over to Fantasy Flight in the LCG format... I think people are going to want that. So I think that's one to go to. Also, do your research, folks. There's some companies like, for example, I love Cosmos, but they're saying, hey, there's only 50 of each exit game per day. That's great, but you can just go out and buy them right now. That's right. <laughs> so that's Although not it's, that it's been, big of a deal. Once it won the, or, yeah, won the Kenner Spiel, uh, it's been out of stock, at least, that I've noticed recently. I understand that, but again... And, and, I, and I can't emphasize this enough, guys. These games are going to be available very shortly thereafter. Right. You will be able to get them. And there are, if you miss a game, please don't let that ruin your con. There are so many other good <laughs> games. Well, I, I mean, that's another thing. Pick one or two that you really want to get right away. Uh, and, and don't be too disappointed if you miss out. because you, You're not going to be able to play all of them before they're out in the general population, in, 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 uh, in the wild. So pick one or two that you really want to get right away and and those are the ones you should focus on wear a big backpack and spin around all the way to the, the to the booth <laughs> people will back up you'll be able to get whatever you want that that, that is the whip round what a good, <laughs> <laughs> what a good segue though the next question is what do you carry around with you so jamie wants you to bring a both a one of those double strollers <laughs> <laughs> while you're dressed in cosplay wearing yep. a backpack yeah, and a big foam sword. Wow, what do you carry around with you while you're in there? Well, carry around your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> well, what uh, about that? Do you do you like what do you do with all the games that you get there? See, we we have a booth now, so we can store them at the booth. Right. But before we did that, I used to be like frustrated because I'd get like ten games, and then I'm like, oh, I'm carrying yeah. these stupid games everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. And that's that's got to be really rough if you didn't get a hotel room that you can walk to. I mean, because we've been at the Omni or the Hyatt in the past couple of years, and you know, when I would fill up, I would just walk them back and walk, and chill out for mm. a couple minutes, come back over to the con and get things going again. But if you got one, if you're taking an Uber from the airport over, I mm. I don't even know what you do at that point. Wow, I you know that's one thing that they need to do. That that Essen Essen has like a coat check type, thing. a bag drop. Oh, yeah. that would be fantastic. You need to be a VIG because they get that, don't they? They do get that. You're right. Uh, Ooh, maybe that should be one of the things they do at Lucas Oil Stadium. Is that's where they put the bag drop, the bag check? It wouldn't hurt to carry around like a granola bar in your pocket, so when you're getting hungry, you can keep going. Or right. some people carry around water. I recommend that too. Yep. Um, I think if I think if they ever had coat check or like lockers for attendees, people would just start sleeping in them, so they don't, <laughs> so they don't have to go back to their hotel. That would be how they solve the hotel problem. Yes, that's right. They should have those I Japanese think, tubes that you like yes, slide into. That's right. what they should put in Lucas Oil Stadium. People would love to sleep on the fifty yard line. I think that you're, you're right, uh, like a granola bar. But I think a bottle of water is the best thing to do because the one thing I've noticed about convention centers is they they always got the AC blasting like crazy, yep. and that makes the room very very dry. 
And when I first started going to Origins uh, like like 12 years ago, I, every third day I would start to get this splitting headache every time. Mm. And I was like, why do I get a headache every year, like right in the middle of the convention? And I realized that it's because I wasn't drinking enough water. Right. And it was I, I was drying out because of the AC, and I would grab that bottle of water now, and I'll just suck the whole thing down. And then, like, a couple hours later, I'll get another one, do the same thing, and it all went away. That whole headache thing gone. So you got to keep yeah. yourself hydrated or you're going to be crashing. Absolutely. I mean, I've got my travel bag, uh, sort of a shoulder bag, messenger bag style, uh, that could hold a game or two in it. I have my water bottle in it, um, and I, I will throw a granola bar or a bag of nuts or something in there. Um, and But then inside that, I have – a couple years ago, Gen Con was giving out – messenger bags like shoulder bags as as like the swag for going i somehow acquired two or three of those and one of those is in the shoulder bag so i could then if i get mm. three or four games i now have the shoulder bag and my messenger bag and and now i'm i'm like a they're like saddle bags and that's usually the limit once i've filled those bags i know that i can't carry anymore and so i should stop buying things one of my favorite things that i've seen at gen con was AEG had that that gigantic shoulder bag that they gave out two years ago? Yeah, and what I loved seeing, uh, and this is this is the evil in me. I would watch people carrying over over stuffing that thing and carrying that thing around. It would rip, and the yep. games would fly in all directions. Oh yes, I, that happened the first time I tried to use one of those things. Uh, oh yeah, you you, you, you were overstuffing. I overstuffed. I, I hit the weight limit right away, and and I've never tried to use one again. Yeah, yeah. Although those big fat cardboard Simon bags that they had are the mm. greatest. They're the greatest. You know what I use those for now? Grocery shopping. I will put them in the back seat of my car. I'll go in, I'll get groceries, put them in the bags, come in, put them in the Simon bags, and then I'll have one trip. One trip carrying two Simon bags, all my groceries. Nice. This is a life life tip from Jamie. Listen, do that. Put it in your car, <laughs> use it for groceries. Cool. Yeah, my wife uses game bags for groceries all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next question is uh, how to avoid – tips on avoiding the massive crowds. Uh, don't go to the exhibitor hall. <laughs> Actually, go to Origins. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, listen. There are places where it is a lot less crowded. For one, um, and this is going to – you can go upstairs. The mm -hmm. second floor is way less crowded, and there are some rooms up there with different events going on. There's a lot of RPGing upstairs, but actually, I think they moved that to the Lucas Oil City, most of it. I but think there's so. a lot of quiet stuff. If you just need to get away from crowds, upstairs works. And mm -hmm. I'll combine this with another question. What publisher's small rooms are worth a visit? The small rooms that publishers run are often quiet. Rio Grande, I've always found that room to be fairly quiet. It is. It, I mean, it's busy, but but you can uh, sit down and play some stuff and actually spend some time in that room and, and not feel like there's a crush of people around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was going to be my advice. Find those publishers rooms where they're doing their demos of their upcoming games. And that's a, you get to play a game, not a crowd. You get to be taught the game. You get a, you get a chance to see what's coming down the pike. Those are some good rooms. There's also lots of events going on outside the convention hall proper. As I mentioned, there's a whole film series. Uh, there's seminars and stuff. Look, look in the convention book for some of those outside the hall events. And once you get into the outer hotels and, and those special events, it's a lot quieter. And, uh, and there's still lots of great things to see. Someone asked what events we're participating in. Our big event that we're doing is the Dice Tower Live Show. It's on Friday at 1 o'clock. It's in the humongous hall. There's 1,200 seats, although we've sold almost 1,100 of them. Ooh. Yeah, that's the Ooh. 500 ballroom, which is a very impressive space. What's the capacity of that one, you say? 1,200. Okay. Hmm. So you got 100 tickets left. Well, you were there last year. That was a big room. And actually, Jamie will be there again. I will, yes. We're, we're going to be doing... hosting once again. And we're going to have uh, some surprise guests. We're not going to actually release what the show's going to be about till we get there. We're going to have some game companies come in and make some announcements. We're going to make a couple of announcements there at the Dice Tower about things in the future. It's going to, and we're going to give away some games. So I'm really excited about that. And the only other event that we're really involved in, well, actually, I'm partially involved in the church service on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. um, but also we, me and Jeremy Salinas from Man vs. Meeple and my editor, Derek, are going to talk about video editing. Uh, maybe I'm just going to sit there and let them talk about it. But, 
I've learned a few tips in my, my actually just learned something new today. That's one thing I'm always striving to do on video is like try to learn one new thing a week um, because there's just the, the tools that you can use to edit video are like about 10,000 times more robust than you actually use. <laughs> so if I could just learn one new thing a week, that's kind of a cool, a cool tip for me. Yeah. Now, this is a good one. It's that this is a good question I've been wondering about. Has the Christmas morning excitement of new games at Gen Con faded a bit for you guys? Hmm. That's a tough one, Tom, because I think for me personally, it all depends on the year and the games. Because like I mentioned a little bit before, I don't think the, the, the crop of games this year is exciting me like it has in the past. There's been a few times in the past where I was like, I got to have that game. I got to go home with that game. Uh, this year I'm looking at the games and none of them are getting me to that level. And I'm not 100% sure if it's because the Christmas morning is gone or if it's the games aren't as cool. I think it's probably the latter for me. But if there was something I had to have, like if they released the the Ground Forces Star Wars miniatures game, I would run to get it. But they didn't announce that yet. <laughs> I think... That, that Christmas feeling is still there for me. It's just that it's there and it, it's spread out in the weeks before the convention now. Hmm. Like sometimes I get games before Gen Con. There's a couple games that I'll have before the convention. And I'm like, wow, these are great new games. So when I get to Gen Con, it's not as exciting because I've already seen the game at home. But that excitement's right. there. I'm just spreading it out more. But I'm still always excited. My, one of my favorite things about Gen Con is all the publishers and designers are all there. So I get yeah. to see them all. So I'm always excited to be like, hey, I haven't seen you in ages. You know, some people we saw at Dice Tower Con and at Origins, but not everybody. But everybody almost is at, is at Gen Con. Mm-hmm. I think the Christmas excitement is there, but it's, it's as if uh, the kids are older and they want to sleep in. So Christmas morning <laughs> doesn't start until like 11 a.m. And it's not, it's not the early morning wake up mom and dad sort of thing anymore. Because we are now, let's continue the metaphor, under the tree at the beginning of Christmas morning, uh, we're all at the booth waiting for people to come so that we can say hi and, and shake some hands and take pictures and, and man the booth for a little while. And then after an hour or two, we get a chance to explore after that initial crush of people. Uh, and, and we still get excited about finding things we didn't know about, uh, getting impressed by, by the look of a game that we weren't as interested in before, or, or discovering more about one that sort of tickled our interest from afar, from a smaller publisher that didn't send a copy to Tom early. Um, so it's, the excitement is there. It's just, it's spread out. It's a little more tempered, delayed a little bit, at least on Thursday. You make an excellent point there, Eric, because, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, back when we first started going to Origins, this is, was our 13th year this year at Origins, when we first started going, man, we were up, we were showered, we were out the door, we were ready to go <laughs> at like 8 o'clock in the morning. Let's have yep. fun. You know, now my guys are, are rolling out of bed at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm, yep. I'm up at like 10 and I'm like, I'm sitting in the Hampton eating some breakfast and just <laughs> chilling. You know, I'm not running over there as fast as I can anymore. So maybe it's just familiarity of the entire the entire experience like i've had the experience now i'm just sort of letting it sink in like i'm I'm just having fun being there there's no like urgency to to make sure that i get up and go you know yeah all right someone asked uh basically what are the best places to game after the main hall closes the gen con library line to get into was way too long last year that's definitely Hmm. true that's they've I really think they've messed up on that room. Yeah, they've had a few years to get it right, too, and I'm not sure. It, it, a lot of it has to do with entry and exit for whatever reason because Gen Con is controlling and requiring the, uh, the, the tickets to, to get in and out. And they keep trying different ways to allow you to enter and exit quickly, but it, it never, especially at peak times, it never seems to work out right. Yeah, but would you want to buy a ticket for a place and you get there and you can't get in because it's full? I'd yeah, that would kind that would of upset. Me. Yeah. You know, I've I've stopped completely trying to play board games at Gen Con, honestly. I mean, this is just me. I know I'm an idiot because there are places to play board games at Gen Con. But, no, I've kind of stopped because it's just difficult for me to find the time and the place to play quietly and have fun. That's actually uh, actually why the, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund game that we put up on 
the, for the auction every year is so awesome to me because, you know, Rodney and Jeff Engelstein and I get a chance to take a break, sit mm. down and play a game with the guy who, who bid and won for the auction. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a, it's like a chill couple of hours that we, where we don't have to be anywhere else because we scheduled it. That's, mm-hmm. that's good for me. Yeah. Um, there's, like I said, those rooms are open pretty late sometimes like the Rio Grande room. And, uh, I, I think greater than games as a room, there's different companies that do rooms, um, they're pretty good to go to. And even that big, humongous gaming hall, which is bigger than almost any other convention, just that hall. Yep. At night, there's a gazillion free tables at it. So you can always go there and play. Just have fun trying to find a place. I right. Mean, fi- find other mm-hmm. people, I guess. And then finally, the this person says they – it's their first Gen Con. Should they drive and find parking each day or better off taxiing in and Ubering? For me – Ubering. 100%. Uber. 100% drive, and I'll tell you why. What? Because if you get there early, if you come in early, you can find parking easy because most people don't come in early, and you have a place to put your games. Yep. You just yeah, said that, point, Tom. That's a good point. That is a I got to side with Tom point. here. Yeah. At least you've got a place to put stuff, um, and you can leave when you want to. I mean, I, it's not difficult to get an Uber, and it's or, or you don't have to wait long to do so, but you have control over your transportation, um, it, I, I've never had to drive in, so I don't have the firsthand experience, but I haven't heard too many people complain about, uh, the, the parking situation at Lucas Oil. Um, although I worry with the whole thing selling out, will that fill up as well? Huh. Uh, well, we'll find out soon enough, I guess. All right. Enough about the convention itself. Let's talk about games we're looking forward to. Do it. It's a dice tower top. The Dice Tower's Top 10 list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Okay, so here we go. Now, the Top 10 list that we do for our games from Gen Con, there's a couple caveats here. First of all, we're never sure, right? These games might be awful. We're just kind of guessing on some of them. However, I used to only talk about games that I haven't played yet. But each year, I get to play more and more games before Gen Con. So you that's kind of disingenuous dog. for the listeners. So there's going to be games on my list that I have played and really like. Hmm. I'm just saying, if these are 10 games that I think people should look at, it's okay. more so. And I also didn't put a bunch of expansions on mine. I'm looking to make sure I don't cross any that Eric might have. The Cities of Splendor expansion I'm looking for. Codenames Marvel, because I love Marvel comics. They're not actually the selling co- that. That's just a demo, I think. Is it just a demo? I think so. Uh, the, the Disney and the Marvel codenames are not going to be sold. Never mind that. I, re- I retract that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually interested in the codenames uh, Disney because yeah, my family be are Disney fanatics. So I think yeah, they would well, really well, dig I that. I, I like the idea of a themed one. Um, Cry Havoc expansion, Nations Dice Game expansion, hmm. the Sheriff of Nottingham expansion, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But let's get to our 10 games. We'll start with Eric. Number 10. My number 10 is Laser Riders. This is, um, it, it's a... a... <laughs> you need a guitar riff in there, Eric. <laughs> I know. I, I'll have to edit one in. Um, it, it's uh, like a light cycle game. You're, you're flying around the table surface and trying to collect gems, and, and you're doing this mechanism where you, you say, I'm going to move like a four-length curve or something. But if you curve, if you're turning, you have to roll a die to see if you make it. Uh, so you could crash, and, and it's kind of like a, a, a cross between Tron and X-Wing. Um, and, and it comes in a box that looks like an old VHS cassette. I, I just I love the aesthetic, <laughs> and the game sounds fun. Laser Riders, my number 10. Wow. Man, wait till you get to mine, Eric. It's going to be s- just as exciting as the one you just explained. <laughs> I, I can't wait. <laughs> I seriously think Laser Riders was designed by some guys who had the X-Wing, uh, the flight paths, and they were like, well, let's make a game just using these. Yeah. yeah. That's what they did. Let's make it like Tron in space. Mm-hmm. Now, Eric, have you played my number 10, Custom Heroes? Uh, I have looked at it. I didn't get a chance to play. So Custom Heroes is very similar. It's a card-crafting game similar to um, Mystic Veil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a trick-taking game. And so as you take tricks, you're going to add and make your cards better and cooler over time. So far, the response has been lukewarm from the people who've played it. But I am disregarding all this. I am going into my better judgment and... 
excited about it anyway because I like trick-taking games and then a game where you can modify the cards sounds fun. All right. That's Custom Heroes from AEG. All right. Well, mine is The Rule, a story of cold trade. Yeah! (laughs) Very, very exciting theme there. Uh, I am a fan. I'm a fan of Capstone Games and these heavy Euros they're coming out with. I think they do a fantastic job of putting together these games. I look at this one, and you may not think, a story of coal trade is going to be very fun. But when I look at the board and I see you're, you're shipping coal down this river and you're dropping them off at towns and you're building locks and things, that's the kind of thing that gets me excited. And I think that this is going to be great. This is the second in their trilogy of coal games. The first one was Haspelnicht or whatever, how you ever say that. I'm not <laughs> German, so I'm getting it wrong, I imagine. But uh, that one I thought was a little too light for my, fl- my taste. This one looks a little heavier, okay. and I'm excited. I'm excited it's for this. Light? The, wow, it's light? The, yes, I thought it was a little bit... Uh, I didn't think it was heavy at all. You thought it was heavy? I didn't think it was heavy, but I wouldn't say it was light. Eh, um, uh, let's go I with medium. Let's go with medium. We'll, we'll meet in the middle. I don't think the game... I, I didn't... I wasn't sitting there playing the cold game going, okay, I wish there was more games in this theme. <laughs> I, I think it's hilarious that they're actually making a trilogy about this entire theme. It's the cold trilogy? Yes, this is game two. Nice. Yes, game two in the trilogy of coal. The Ruhr, a story of coal trade. I'm excited for it. Yeah. Number nine. My number nine is Three Secrets from D.V. Jochi. Uh, this is another sort of mystery type game. These are the folks that put out Deckscape. Uh, and the mechanism involves one player knowing what's going on and being able to give clues to the other players who are trying to discover uh, the situation or the mystery that's uh, on the table at the time. But the more questions you ask the the, the person who knows, the the lower your score is going to be at the end. I'm I'm sort of fascinated by this mystery social sort of game. I want to see how it all works. Three Secrets, my number nine. Yeah, I wasn't as keen on this one, actually, Eric. It's very similar to Dark Stories from Z-Man Games. And I like Dark Stories better because the, I felt like the, the three secret stuff was too hard to guess from the clues. Really? It was, it was just like made up stuff. Maybe you'll like it more than me though. But is the subject matter less dark than Dark Stories? Like I'd love to play Dark Stories with my family. It seems like a really good car game. But I don't really want to do all the murder and mayhem with my kids. It's mostly crime. Mm, okay. Well, us Pennsylvanians, we love murder and mayhem with our kids. So <laughs> send it over to us. Uh, you mean, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> I think it's East Pennsylvania. That's, All right, that's my just number Steve. nine is, is Museum Heist. This one is coming from Fox Mind. It looks like actually a fairly light game about people trying to rob stuff from a uh, museum. I tend to like Fox Mind games. I know they're on the lighter side, but I don't know. I, I, I think they're like an underrated company, and I'm pretty excited to see this game. I just like the theme. I like the idea of robbing. <laughs> because I'm also from Pennsylvania. There you go. <laughs> Museum heist. It looks fun. I think it looks like an interesting game. They don't have many pictures here on Board Game Geek, but uh, but uh, the theme sounds like a lot of fun. Well, my number nine is also a fairly light-looking game. It is called Deadline. And this one is a theme that I absolutely adore. It is Pulp Noir detectives trying to solve mysteries. Now, I have to say that the game itself isn't really about solving mysteries. It's more about playing cards and getting sets of of icons and things. But it it seems like a cool card game in that respect. But it has the theme of of solving mysteries and being detectives and playing these like pulp noir type characters. Got the matchbooks in there that that if you get the matchbooks, you can flip them over to to uh, give yourself a little bonus here and there. And I, I just think it looks like a fun game. Nothing that I'm too f- going bananas and crazy about, but I would certainly like to have it and check it out and, and play it. That's Deadline. Number eight. My number eight is Dragon Island. It's coming from R&R Games from designer Mike Fitzgerald. And I really don't know much about the gameplay of this. I just know that it's Mike's first non-card game. Mm. Uh, and, and that sort of fascinates me. And, and I know you, you capture dragons and you, you sort of make them more powerful and get them to do stuff. And that you can have the dragons die, which 
I don't want to do, but I'm sort of interested to see how it happens. Uh, so I'm just I'm curious about Dragon Island, which is why it's my number eight. Now, that excites me, Eric. That does, because I didn't Killing think dragons? of it that way. No, 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 no. Killing dragons? We do that in our spare time up here in PA. But oh, yeah. what I'm talking about is Mike Fitzgerald <laughs> and his. Uh, and this is his first non-card game. I didn't even think of that. You're right. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. And I think that's actually got this on my radar now. I didn't even think All of right. that. I want to see what he can do with some components. Who'd you say the publisher was again, Eric? R&R. Huh. All right. My number eight is actually a game that I normally wouldn't expect. It's from IDW. I believe it's pronounced Saikatsu. Seikatsu. This one, Seikatsu. Thank Katsu. you, Eric. This one actually is intriguing to me. It's like an abstract game, but the, you're placing pieces on the board, but you're scoring based on how you can see it from your side of the board. Hmm. Hmm. And I like that concept. I've, I've seen games like that before with skyscrapers and stuff, but this one has like a zen feel to it to some degree. So they they showed it. They were showing a prototype of it at uh, Origins, and I stopped and looked at it for a while. And I was like, man, I just like this concept. I like this idea. Uh, it, and if it's like three players too, that's really cool because there's not a lot of three player abstract games. You know, most abstracts are two. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm 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 pretty pumped about this one. It's 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 a smaller game. I don't think people are running for this one, but I'm interested in it. Say Katsu. Beautiful too. Got some nice artwork. Like it. Well, my number eight is, honestly, I got to say, it looks completely stupid, but that's why I want it. It It looks so stupid, (laughs) but I want it because of that. It's called Shark Island. Mm. Now, we have Richard Launius involved with this and Pete Sheary of of Simon fame, and this is a game about one person plays basically Jaws, the, the shark in Jaws, let's put it that way. And everybody else plays the goofball, uh, you know, uh, sailors that go out and think they're going to catch the shark. I love that whole section of the movie Jaws where all those idiots are filling up their boats and sailing out. And Chief Birdie's running around. It's like, oh, no, too many people on that boat. Ah!" I love that whole scene. And this game is that. All those idiots going out there trying to catch a shark. And of course, the sharks going around terrorizing the island. I guess eating up people, and the the <laughs> the the, uh, the guys with the harpoons are going around trying to stab ju- stab the shark to death. So dumb. This is so dumb. But I want to play this game so badly. I think it's going to be just a blast, like a, a goofy beer and pretzels type game. And hmm. I trust these guys to put out a cool game. So I'm going to be coming home with Shark Island under my arm. Here's my worry about this game. It's the publisher. Upper Deck, huh? Um, Upper Deck has done a great job with Marvel Legendary and their Legendary Encounters games. And pretty much everything else they've done has not been that fantastic. Hmm. So I'm hoping this will buck that trend. But the stupidity look of it, (laughs) you know, I hope the game is better than all that. You know what I mean? So I also hope for Pete's sake, because Pete's such a great guy. I love to see a game of his do well. Uh Plus... Pete Shirey is a huge shark fan, so this is, this is. feels like his baby, and and mm-hmm. so I'm I'm really hoping that whatever his vision was for this gets fulfilled by the production. Right, and and let me say, when I say stupid or dumb, that's coming from the best place of love possible because I love <laughs> stupid and dumb. Sometimes I love it. There you go. And this looks perfect for me. Shark Island. Sometimes stupid and dumb is just fine. Exactly. Number seven. My number seven is a deck builder called Palaces. Uh, This comes from Guerrilla Games. This has been in production for a while. I I got to see this many years ago uh, at, not many, but several years ago at the Gamma Trade Show. Uh, I've been following its production. The art I always enjoyed. This is a deck builder that also has a tower building mechanism where you have to use cards to build your towers. You have two towers. You have to build them evenly in order to score points. Uh, So yeah, one tower you can build however you want, but now you're restricted in what you can do with the second tower. You have to build it just like the first one. Uh, So neat stuff going on. I haven't seen or played this game in at least a year, maybe two. So I'm fascinated and interested to see what they've done with it. That's number seven, Palaces. My number seven is Downforce. Mm. Now, Downforce is one of the games from Restoration Games. They're a Mm. new company that is remaking older games uh, with uh, Rob Davu as the main developer on do- on remaking these games. They have three games coming out, and all three are really good. They're all um, awesome. Every one of them is great. 
and and actually, I think indulgence is probably my favorite because I love the trick takingness. But mm-hmm. the, for sheer fun, for sheer fun, one of the best racing games you will ever play. Downforce is amazing. Hmm. It is so much fun. You are racing these cars around the board. It's a really fast game. You bet on the cars that you think are going to win at different points in the race. You can win with if your cars don't, you know, finish. Who cares? You're just as long as you bet on maybe the cars that did win. It is so much fun. I I I played this game. This is one of my most played games of the year, actually, so far. Huh. Really I, enjoying this one. I have to agree with you, Tom. I cannot say a single negative thing about this game. Everybody I play with that loves it. They don't care about NASCAR or IndyCar racing, whatever it is. They don't care. They don't want it. They don't even want to play it when I say, let's play this. When I get it out and force them to play it, they're like, wow, that's cool. Let's do that again. That When somebody says, let's play that again, that's when you hit, hit on a winner. And this one does it. It's a good one. Yeah. It's a stellar production of a classic that deserves the interest. Great game. Yeah. Uh, my number seven is one that actually you could just buy right now on Amazon, but uh, – uh, I just discovered it because they're releasing it at Gen Con. It is called Tournament at Camelot. And this is a trick-taking game that sort of emulates a, a tournament going on in the in the castle, in the Camelot. And I don't know tons about it and the, the mechanics of how it all operates. I watched Sam Healy's video, and I got excited uh, based on what he was talking about it. And I just think that the artwork is amazing. It's got period artwork, like kind of like liter- literary artwork of the whole King Arthur bit. You got characters and their companions. All the cards are, you know, like 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 poison swords and blah, 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 and all this different stuff. And when I was looking at it, I was like, you know what? I want to have this game. I want to have this game and I want to try it. It just looks like a fun trick taking card game that has a really cool theme and some fantastic artwork. I'm going to come home with this one, too. Tournament at Camelot. Yeah, Sam Healy has been like raving about this one. He says it's better than <laughs> indulgence. I'm like, All right, what? we'll have to see. Yeah, exciting me. I'm gonna try it. Don't let me down, Sam. <laughs> number six. My number six is one of our few crossovers on our list. Uh, somebody else has it, so I'll just wait here by this group of trees and see what happens. <laughs> My number six is from Wiz Kids. It's Dungeons and Dragons: Tomb of Annihilation. Now, this is yet, I think this is the sixth game in the series. Yeah. The Castle Ravenloft, Wrath of a Shard Line, Lessons of Drist, and all that. Is, Jamie, you're, you're more up to date with this sort of, uh, the D&D. Is this one of the modules from D&D, Tomb of Annihilation? Yes, it is. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has been putting out campaign books uh, since 5th uh, edition released. And Tomb of Annihilation is one. The Storm King's Thunder is one that came with the uh, that came along at the same time as the Wrath of the Giant. What is it? Assault of the Giants came, board game came out. So yeah, they're putting out board games in tandem with their campaign books that they're putting out, which I think is fantastic. That all these publishers and Wizards of the Coast are coordinating to put these things out and kind of get D and D five out there. And I think it's working because Dungeons and Dragons five is going gangbusters in the rpg world it's the most bought the most played role-playing game ever at this point yeah so i'm pretty excited I, I like this system it's a fun cooperative game i like the fact that this is going to come in the pre-paint it for some of us mm-hmm. don't paint well so i like that yeah um or you can get the regular version and i just this is a fun system for me so dungeons and dragons tomb of annihilation also i love that name tomb of annihilation <laughs> oh yeah go in, <laughs> yeah i would never go in such a thing you see the sign you turn back go home <laughs> Well, you're not a you're not a heroic adventurer, Tom. If you're not going so, into the tomb of annihilation, because the first time I saw a giant rat, I'd be like, "I'm out." <laughs> I'm done later. But we already know you, know you don't want any scorpions, so. <laughs> oh, don't even start, man! I'm still scared. <laughs> So my number six is coming out from Bezier Games, and it is not a werewolf game, which I'm so oh, happy about. Yet. Yeah, he's going to make a werewolf version <laughs> Probably of it. Probably somewhere stop. along the line, somewhere along the line of uh, w- trains, in, uh, trains in werewolf. Anyway, so it's Whistle Stop. This is a uh, sort of a lighter version of a railroad-style game. You're uh, laying tracks, you're pick up and deliver, and I think Bezier Games just does artwork and components amazing. And I think this one, even though when you look at the pictures, it kind of looks a little bit like a mess. There's there's tracks flying in all directions with hexes everywhere. But what this one gives me is kind of a tiny little vibe 
of uh, of suburbia in that it has the hex tiles and you're placing the hex tiles and things and trying to position things in such a way that you can pick up and deliver and do these things. I think this game looks great. I love train games that aren't 18xx insanity games. I like lighter train games. And I think this one's going to be a good sort of quicker version, nice little spatial relations type game. I dig it. Whistle Stop looks cool. This was on my short list. Uh, I, I will certainly swing by the booth and check this out. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty pumped about this one myself. Number five. My number five is the next game in the Deckscape series, The Fate of London. This is also from D.V. Jochi. Uh, and, and it you know, it, you may have noticed over the past couple of months, I'm a bit ravenous for these escape room games. And although I was a little lukewarm on the first Deckscape game, I still enjoyed it a lot and want more. So... Number five, The Fate of London from Deckscape. (laughs) My number five was Eric's number six, and that's Hot Shots. This is a cooperative game from um, Fireside Games, Mm -hmm. which actually is kind of ironic because the game is about putting out fires. And I've always thought this was a good theme, right? When fires hit California and stuff, it's a pretty horrific thing. But we're all very glad that the firefighters and people come through and put it out. You know, there's there's a lot of games where we're playing pretty uh, depraved people, individuals. Sometimes it's nice to play heroes, like mm-hmm. real heroes. Yeah. So that's that's I guess that's that's my thinking here is I like the theme. This is the kind of theme I can bring out and be like, hey, we're putting out a fire and, it's, and they're not people aren't going to roll their eyes and go, oh, you got your swords and stuff. No, 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 worry. Our fire hoses, bring it on. Let's do it. <laughs> Hot shots. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about this. I got to play this at the Gamma Trade Show and enjoyed my play. My son is interested. He was actually watching our live stream at Gamma, and every time I've gone to a convention, he's like, is Fireside going to be there? Is Hot Shots out yet? So he is – I have to bring this home because he wants it so much. Uh, it's it's a neat game, and uh, the wind mechanic is cool. It's got this spatial thing with the fire spreading. It's 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 neat. I like it. So my number – Five, I guess we're on five now. My number five is a game that isn't depraved either, which kind of makes me sad. It is called <laughs> Bunny Kingdom. Oh, I was really hoping what? Bunny Kingdom. Richard Garfield. Now, this guy is the king of game designers. Designed Magic the Gathering and a billion and a half other games, most of them terrific. So I, when I see Richard Garfield design a game, I sit up and take notice. So I'm looking at this game. I'm seeing it's a grid board with all sorts of different terrains on it. You got bunnies hopping around the land. You're building cities and putting your bunnies in the cities. The only thing I'm sad about is that you can't blow each other up. (laughs) Uh, I mean, at least I don't think so. The description doesn't say these bunnies are killing each other. But uh, I'm looking forward to this game. I think it looks like a fun little city building and territory expansion. And you're collecting resources and stuff. I think it's a cute theme. Bunnies hopping around building cities. So I kind of want... Richard Garfield's Bunny Kingdom. Number four. Number four is the latest in the Codenames franchise. That's Codenames Duet, which uh, turns it into a cooperative two-player game. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated with with getting to play this with my son and and working on his vocabulary skills and, and h- helping him get a little more... Um, uh, savvy with with language because he, he's fun to play regular code names with um, as it is because he has weird interpretations for things. But I also <laughs> am fascinated by by the map. There's this map that sort of uh, tracks your progress as you complete rounds of this game, uh, and and it makes things more difficult, tweaks the rules a little bit. You can go for the easy path or the hard path and see how you do. Uh, I'm fascinated by it. I even though it's been out in several places in demo mode, I have not had a chance to play it yet. So I'm still fascinated by the concept. Codenames Duet, my number four, must get. Uh, yeah, Jamie, what do you feel about code names? I love code names, the words versions. I don't like code names pictures. Uh, now I like mixing code names and code names pictures together, but ultimately I really enjoy code names and we've had a, a blast playing in the past. Um, but I feel as though that it kind of disappeared off of our radar at this point. Nobody's going back to it. Insider is the game that we're right into right now, as far as our sort of party style, have fun game. Um, but yeah, Codenames is still a good game, and I dig it. My next game is Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time. That's a cool name. Because of the name. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, uh, this game, uh, it's from Funforge, and I tend to like their stuff. And Matthew Dunstan did it, and he also did Elysium, 
which I think is a fantastic game. Mm-hmm. So I'm I. This guy has stolen a bunch of stuff throughout time, and it's your job to stop him. I like the concept. I like time travel. It's almost always fumbled in a board game. Mm. Almost always. But I'm hoping that this time it will be put right. This time? This, this, is what, <laughs> this time. <laughs> See? Because time. Yes. <laughs> well, well, actually, I portrayed Professor X in a Citadel time, and it was a problem. So he said that he would go back in time and fix it. Hmm. That was a bad joke. Sorry. Hang on. <laughs> I didn't even notice the joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm sick, guys. Yeah, That's Tom's on some cold medicine right now. Uh, I just, just so you know. No, There's, listen, listen. Nyquil's starting to and, kick in. <laughs> Shen Con and Jamie are healing me. I started this this episode at 102 degrees, and I'm I'm feeling better. I'm I'm, I'm telling you, it's it's it's, it's Gen Con. Okay. Absolutely. It's the Gen Con heals. All right. Well, I'll bring you back down to sick again, Tom. I'm going to talk about. My number four, Planetarium. Now, say what you want about Game Salute. One thing they do right is make things look beautiful. And this game is gorgeous. I look at the card, graphic design, and the artwork, and I gotta have it. This is a, a strange little game where you have is kind of like a solar system with all these orbits, and your and planets are kind of circling the orbit. And there's also this matter that's floating around out there too, and you're trying to get the matter to touch the planets so the planets can develop and evolve. And I think that just sounds like a very interesting tactical, again, spatial relations type, almost an abstract game with a cool kind of theme applied to an abstract game. And then you got cards that do all sorts of different things. And again, it just looks beautiful. I dig this game. I think this looks like a winner. Planetarium. Number three. My number three is unfortunately a bit of a question mark as to whether it's going to be at Gen Con. It does not show up in the BGG Gen Con preview, although all the release dates say that it's it should be out by then. So I'm really hoping Simon has Potion Explosion, the fifth ingredient. This is the expansion for the game that is currently my wife's favorite. It, it adds an additional ingredient, as the name would suggest, uh, that's a wild marble. But they don't start out in the hopper. You have to sort of use potion effects to get them to go in there. You swap them out, uh, and then they become part of the system as these wild uh, marbles that then can cause bigger reactions because they become any color. So you, when you have them connect in the in the rack, they you know can trigger multiple colors, and I, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this all comes together. Uh, Potion Explosion, the fifth ingredient, fingers crossed that it's there, and it's my number three. My number three is a game that I honestly think should be nominated for the Spiel des Jahres, and that's Photosynthesis. This is from Blue Orange Games, and this game is unbelievably amazing. It's so simple. Hmm. You are basically planting trees in this field, and the sun is moving around and hitting your trees, which gives you more points to plant more trees. Uh, it, it's uh, On your turn, you have a few actions you can do based on how much currency you have and sun points from the sun hitting your trees, and you're blocking other people's trees with yours, it is so well designed. It's one of those games. It's clean. It's simple. I, I cannot praise this game enough. I was just mind boggled at how much fun it was, how deep it was. Um, Blue Orange has put out some really good games in the past, but this one I think is the best game they've ever done. Hmm. Okay. Well, Blue Orange is knocking it out of the park lately. And let me tell you, Tom, this game does look fantastic. It was on my short list. I should probably uh, swap it out for Shark Island. Because this game does look great. <laughs> but no, no really, it does. It looks amazing. And you have the little tree miniatures, kind of the cardboard miniatures that you put around the board. I think it just looks like a neat concept. But I think sharks eating people is more exciting than planting and growing trees. <laughs> yeah, but. you're right. You're right. But this is photosynthesis. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think photosynthesis is in a game that will still be in print in five years. I really do. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, if it takes off. But I, I really think it has that possibility. Very, very few times I play a game and go, this game is going to be big. I think photosynthesis could be big. Hmm. I think it may be. I'm hoping. Well, well, it's on my radar for sure. And good game trumps good theme every day in the week. My number three is a Call of Cthulhu game, Mountains of Madness. Now, I take no shame in still following the cult of the Call of Cthulhu love in the board gaming community. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't care. I love it. And I will, I will always look into every game that has that theme on it. Now, this one is obviously the Mountains of Madness uh, you know, story from H.P. Lovecraft. And I just think this sounds very interesting. Uh, I, there, there isn't much information on how the game plays on Board Game Geek, but when I look at the components, I see that the there's tiles all kind of laid out in a mountain fashion, and I'm assuming that you're going from the bottom and moving upwards and sort of dealing with the issues that you're that that happen in the story as you ascend this thing. You have also characters you're dealing with, your sanity, you have cards that well, have all sorts the, of uh, different uh, uh, items and, and dogs and revolvers and all sorts of things. Let me give you the rundown of, okay. of how this game works. Hit it. It's a, it's a cooperative game, and you're trying to get to the end. Cthulhu's there in the background almost. The game is all about madness. Each time, each turn you go to this tile, and this tile will have tests. Like, you need to get between 7 and 8 of these yellow cards and 9 to 10 of red cards. Everyone has these cards in their hand, and so you're working together in 30 seconds to get these cards. Everyone's going to play the right cards on the test, and if you solve the test, you go to the next tile. Okay. However, you will be getting madness cards, and these madness cards will say things like, you must sing the entire time. Or they'll say things like, you can only speak when someone speaks to you first. And the madness cards get harder and harder. Like the last time I played, I had to close my eyes every time the test was being played. So I quick memorized all my cards and I'm shouting out stuff like, I got a four blue, I think. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm not quite sure. So this game is actually closer to a party co-op game. I don't know how else to yeah. describe it. Huh. So well, it's, 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 it's super silly. We're actually going to be doing a live playing of it. I'm pretty sure Sam and Z are going to hate it. <laughs> but I'm going to make them play it live anyway because I think it would be funny to watch. Just because there's like – all kinds of weird madnesses in there. There was one where the guy had a mustache with his finger, and he couldn't talk unless someone else did a mustache with their finger, and we never <laughs> figured that out, so he just never talked. <laughs> um, so it's it's cultist party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the, I mean, the, don't get me wrong. The box cover is phenomenal. That's such a cool – that's like one of the coolest covers I've ever seen for a box. But it looks more Cthulhu, I think, than it is. It's more of a silly – party game but at the same time you really are trying hard you're like it's like you have these disabilities you're like oh, i must give this information out even though i can never use verbs hmm. uh, on, on my turn because that's i mean stupid man you can't even tell people what your madness is interesting <laughs> well that does sound fun i mean you're right tom it doesn't sound like cthulhu creepy maddening it sounds just goofy and also, I'm noticing here Rob Davio is one of the designers, and it's not a legacy game. So that's also very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited. Yep. I'm, I'm even more excited, actually, for Mountains of Madness now. Number two. Number two was announced at Gen Con last year. And uh, I, am, I am a huge Buffy fan, as, as many of you know. And so legendary Buffy the Vampire Slayer has been on my radar since that announcement at Gen Con. I am super excited to see how the Buffy franchise has been worked into the legendary system. I was slightly disappointed to hear it was not a legendary encounters game. Because I, I sort of mm. like the co-op aspect of that a little better. But maybe they've added mechanisms that I'm going to like even better. I, I don't know. Uh, they've used stills from the show. Uh, so, so they don't have any crazy art issues that are going to pop up. Uh, it, it, it looks fun. I'm excited about a new Buffy game. Legendary Dude, Buffy the Vampire it Slayer. It's, you're putting it in here just because of Buffy. I miss right? Buffy. I miss it. I miss Buffy. It's my number I'm telling two. you, I think, I think it's funny because Upper Deck will probably make an announcement here. We were laughing like, all right, they're just going to say the word legendary and then an IP. <laughs> That's just what's going to mm -hmm. happen. Yep. But if it's a good IP, I'm happy. Buffy. Listen, I'm with you, Eric, on the whole concept of putting things on your list just because you like the IP. Mm -hmm. Wait for mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but well, we'll get to yours in a second. Yeah. My number two is a bit self-serving, but I think Viral is a phenomenal game. Mm. It's in the Dice Tower Essentials. It is an area control game where you are viruses trying to destroy uh, this guy's body, um, except the doctors keep fighting back. These stupid doctors keep curing you over the course of this game. <laughs> um, but you mutate and learn how to fight back against the doctors. It is a lot of fun. I think it's just the perfect length. It's a nice medium-weight area control game with... I think, really good artwork. It's silly looking, you know, because I, I actually had someone email me and said, this is kind of an insensitive game, you know. A lot of people die from cancer and stuff. I said, well, 
you're not actually cancer in this game. You're like a silly virus. And I think the guy survives at the end. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> feel great, but he survives. But I'm telling you, folks, this is definitely one you want to check out. Viral. Yeah, I had a chance to play this at Dice Tower Con. It, it's it's chaotic. It's goofy. Um, there's there's an ebb and flow you have to figure out because if you're too successful, you will uh, you'll get cured and all of your viruses will die and you have to come back uh, with with nothing on the board. But if you can get that that rhythm going, uh, you can you can do things better than your opponents. It's neat. So my number two, I am right in line with Eric. Eric said that he picked Buffy the Vampire Slayer because he loves the theme. And I actually, I had the same exact situation as you last year at Gen Con regarding Legendary. Because I thought it was going to be Legendary Encounters, but it was not. It was just Legendary, which I don't like nearly as much. My game this year is Big Trouble in Little China, the game. Mm. And this game has Jack Burton miniatures. It's got... Uh, crazy weird monsters and lightning dudes all from the movie you're you're rolling dice you're poking and this one also has the player boards that where you poke the dice into the holes so one of your favorite mechanics there tom (laughs) well i'm sold now (laughs) and uh, also the board is you move around chinatown you go down to the the underworld uh i don't know if this game is going to be good in the slightest Uh, (laughs) i'm actually erring on the fact that it'll probably be bad but I love Big Trouble in Little China so much that I want to own this game and play this game, and I'm mm. very excited for it. So, Big Trouble in Little China, the game. Is it bad that Big Trouble in Little China isn't the cultural touchstone for me that it is for a lot of other people? This was never a movie I cared for. Well, then get off the show. Okay. It's an amazing movie. All right. My, my concern with this is what I said earlier, Jamie. It's made by Everything Epic Games. Mm-hmm. And the only other game they made that's been published so far, they've announced, is Secrets of the Lost Tomb, yeah. which was kind of a bloated mess. It was a gigantic mess. And it was the funniest <laughs> It was the funniest mess I've ever played. I'm telling you, we laughed more at the game than we did at the jokes in the game. <laughs> but let me tell you, we had fun playing that bloated mess with a funny game. <laughs> well, then maybe that will work. We'll have yeah. to wait and see. Yeah, that bodes well. Okay. Yeah. And finally, number one. My number one, I know, was proven to be a great game. Uh, one of my favorites of last year was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, and this is the new expansion, the Monster Book of Monsters, uh, that adds creatures, a creature mechanism. It also adds Luna Lovegood into the mix, and I have been told that you don't have to have played through all seven stories to integrate this into your system, which will be great for my kids since we had to stop at book seven for spoilery reasons. So I'm very excited to have more content for Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle with the Monster Box of Monsters, my number one. I'm very excited about my number one because it's by possibly my favorite designer currently, and that's Emerson Matsuchi. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's from Plat Hat Games, and it's Crossfire. Now, it's a, I, I wish they named it something else because there's multiple games called Crossfire. Yeah. yeah. But um, I was confused Crossfire, by that at first. Yeah, Crossfire is a social deduction game. And in it, one person is a sniper. And everyone else is like either the one person's a president and other people are uh, agents for the president. And some of them are trying to assassinate the president. And the sniper is trying to take out the person who's going to try to kill the president. So they have to figure out who it is. And they're doing this by people are looking at each other's cards, a little bit like good cop, bad cop to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, man, I tell you, when I played this, it was like two years ago, so I don't know how much it's changed. But it was the most fun social deduction game I'd played in ages. So much fun and so much pressure on that guy to, like, decide who they're going to snipe. Yeah. But at the same time, everyone's, like, giving him information and we're sitting around trying to discuss, like, don't listen to Jamie. It's obvious that he's the bad guy type thing. I hmm. loved it. And Emerson has not yet made a bad game, in my opinion. Huh. You are absolutely right. Emerson Matsushi is one of the best designers we got right now. This guy has got a mind like you wouldn't believe. Uh, he's a fantastic you know, software developer and a fantastic game developer. He just takes all of the, that knowledge from software development and makes it work in a game. And, boy, he's just great. So I'm very excited for this one, too, because I love Emerson. Yeah, I think I got a chance to play this in an early form as well a year or two ago, and I'm excited to see what it became. All right, and my number one, I mentioned a little bit earlier, maybe a little tease. 
<laughs> it is Jeff Engelstein from Wiz Kids, which I cannot believe it, but Wiz Kids is putting out good games finally. <laughs> the Expanse, the board game, I'm I'm dying to get this game. Uh, Jeff has said that he took inspiration from Twilight Struggle. He distilled it down. He made it a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of a quicker game than Twilight Struggle was, but in and applied this theme of the expanse on it, which is a show that I dig. I love this show. I think it's fantastic. You got the factions of the earth guys and you got the factions of the Martians and the icers, uh, the outer rim guys. And, I am just ex- so excited to get a hold of this game and try it. I think that my group is going to just eat this up. Uh, and it looks gorgeous, too, on top of that. So I'm going to be there. It's my first, my first trip to any booth. It's going to be the WizKids booth. And I'm going to, I'm going to snag a copy of The Expanse from Jeff Engelstein. Can't wait. My number, well, actually, we're done with my number. We're going to go to People's <laughs> Choice now. Sorry. So the People's Choice is interesting. For number 10, they said Unearth. Mm. This is a game that almost made my list. It has some really cool mm. artwork. I like the way it looks. Beautiful game. I love it. Number nine, the expansion map for Terraforming Mars, uh, Alice and Elysium. Yes, mm. yes. Which, as far as I can tell, I'm, I'm it's sitting here right in front of me, actually. it's It looks like it's just two more maps, really. So if you did get enough of Terraforming Mars, this is like just ways to move things, put things on the boards in different places and have different goals that you go for. Mm-hmm. I am so... An, a, astounded by how many people are playing and loving terraforming mars i literally every game every game event i go to there's one or two copies there being played constantly this game's yeah. craziness and it shows because it's a great game should have won kenner spiel's yaris honestly i don't know why that uh it didn't beat uh, exit because exit's amazing exit's amazing <laughs> but you play it once and you throw it out. This game's better. It's better, but the components are better. That, that's, right, good. That's, true. That's, true. Mm. that's true. And then for eight, for People's Choice, Downforce, the racing game. Seven, Doing? the Sheriff of Nottingham expansion, which is probably just because they're Dice Tower fans. <laughs> Six, Mountains of Madness. Five, Whistle Stop. Four, Pen- Cities of Splendor. People actually put Pandemic Legacy Season 2, but as far as we know, that's not there at all. Mm. If it is there, that would blow everyone's mind. They but, say yeah. there might be a demo available something. Right. Three code names do it. Two viral and by a mile. Number one is First Martians. Oh, from- yeah. Man. Which is interesting because none of us put that on our list. It's true. It, uh, it looks great. It looks fantastic. Well, honestly, Tom, the reason I didn't put it on is because I got it. So <laughs> I'm not excited for it or have it. You're already past that. <laughs> I'm already past it. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't put it on my list. I um I don't know if I Well it's I, interesting. I, it's getting reamed a little bit in early reviews. Really? Uh the rule book is not being praised at all. Uh, well, Portal Games, I haven't found a rule book that I do like. That <laughs> their games are all mostly all fantastic, but I've never have found a rule book that I've been able to get through without help. Thank God for Rodney. And his, I think I need to win a scenario minute, in Robinson Crusoe before I can go into First Martians. Rodney's 50-minute video, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so have you played it yet? I have not played it yet, no, but I'm, I'm getting there. All righty. Well, that's it, folks, for our Gen Con episode. So, Jamie, thanks so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you both for having me. I always have a blast coming on here, and I will come on any time you would like. Awesome. Yes. Well, hopefully we'll have fewer technical. Well, our, our, we, I think, folks, we've spent like 30 minutes, and we're not even <laughs> sure if my, my sound is going to be good. If my sound's bad, it was just a bad day of many problems. Eric was got the, all his problems. The they, they're fine. Eric's a professional. Sure. <laughs> anyway, folks, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And I'm Jamie from The Secret Cabal. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 516 was recorded on July 27th, 2017. Coming up next week, Tom and I talk about our mega game experience. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. 
The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with production assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, and Rob Searing. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Legendary tool for the Pied Piper provided by Fabled Flute. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at Dicetower at gmail.com, or follow us on Facebook. And, of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including the Out of Game Podcast, 20 Minutes of Filler, the Snakes Cast, the D6 Generation, the Family Gamers, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, the Portal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game Breakfast at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower... Have fun gaming. So quick, what's the best food truck at Gen Con? Isn't there like a – there was one I really I thought the sound – I'd never actually been to one of those food trucks. Really? Before. Not a single yeah. one. You know, I don't go to the food trucks myself because – it takes too much time. I just go to a regular restaurant, but I will have to say that there's a taco truck that's always parked right outside of the door. Go to that. Get the tacos. They're delicious. There's one that's right. named Nacho Mama that I always wanted to go to. <laughs>